Welcome to our March edition of the University of Idaho, Utah State University and University of Wyoming Extension Sheep and Goat webinar series that we offer once a month. Um, welcome back to all of our folks that have been joining us for a couple of years now and welcome to all the new folks that are joining us today to welcome our speaker, um, Ryan Knuth, who's out of the University of Wyoming right now, um, working on finishing up his uh, PhD there. And um, he grew up on a small flock operation in South Central Wisconsin. And then he attended the University of Wisconsin at Platteville to get his bachelor's degree in animal science with a science emphasis. Then he moved out west and got his master's degree in animal and range sciences at Montana State University. Um, there he worked on research uh, related to the prevalence and production impacts of subclinical mastitis and extensively managed ewes. And then he moved on to start his PhD program at the University of Wyoming. And his doctoral research is investigating the microbial communities of ewes, lambs, and the environment to find the common relationships across communities and identify possible pathways for bacteria to enter the mammary gland to cause mastitis. Um, he has also worked to identify levels and types of antimicrobial resistance in uh, ewe milk bacterial isolates. And we're really excited because um, myself and uh, one of the other hosts, Chad Page out of Utah, uh, both went to school in Wyoming and we have some connections there. So it's fun to kind of get together and um, sort of have that Wyoming uh, family jump in with us. So welcome, Ryan, and I will pass it on to you to talk to us about managing mastitis in our flocks and um, herds. All right, thank you, Dr. Ellison, for that introduction. I am happy to be here today. Uh, before I dive into my presentation, I wanna to touch on some past webinar speakers who have spoke about mastitis. They all come from a variety of backgrounds, some from the commercial industry side of, side of things and others uh, from either the USDA, and so all of these past webinars can be found on the University of Idaho Extension Livestock YouTube channel. So we can just go ahead and click on videos. And there we have all the past webinars that have been uh, conducted in these past couple of years. So a great resource to go back and uh, rewatch some of these webinars that we've enjoyed. So now diving into mastitis. What exactly is mastitis? Mastitis is simply defined as an inflammation of the mammary gland. It can result from bacterial infection, viral infection, mechanical trauma, and chemical trauma. Of these, bacterial infection is the most common, and it will be uh, what I mostly cover throughout this presentation today. Viral infection causing mastitis are mostly caused by the small ruminant lentivirus. This is the same virus that causes OPP, or ovine progressive pneumonia in sheep, as well as CAE, or caprine arthritis and encephalitis in goats. And then we also observe mechanical and chemical traumas causing some inflammation of the mammary gland. Uh, these are more common in dairy systems uh, with improper vacuum pressure and the use of harsher chemicals uh, to disinfect the teats and udders. So these are all the sources that can cause inflammation of the mammary gland. And again, bacterial infection is the most common cause. So obviously bacterial infection there are bacteria that are within the mammary gland that causes an immune response initially observed with inflammation. And I'll be talking more about this immune response uh, in, a, in a few more slides. Mastitis is commonly uh, divided or classed into two different states. We have clinical mastitis, which I'm sure most of us are well familiar with. And clinical mastitis has visually apparent signs. So in the udder, it can often appear swollen, firm, and feverish, or hot to the touch. Milk is often abnormal in odor, color, and consistency, so it might have a foul smell associated with it. The color might be a little more a translucent, a little more yellow or green or red or brown, lots of different colors associated with clinical mastitis. And then some abnormal consistency, so we might get some flakes or clumps or chunks uh, in the milk that we observe. And sometimes the ewe or doe with clinical mastitis uh, has systemat systemic signs, such as decreased appetence or a fever. So she's just off feed then, she's kind of hurting, she's in a little bit of pain, so that might uh, cause her to get off feed a little bit. 
However, subclinical mastitis is basically an invisible disease. So there's no visually apparent signs in the udder, milk, or infected animal itself. Uh, subclinical mastitis is much more prevalent than clinical mastitis. I'll be touching on the prevalence uh, later on in this presentation. And importantly, subclinical mastitis may or may not spontaneously clear the infection. So how do these bacteria actually enter the mammary gland to infect it? Well, in this figure, we have a ewe standing in her environment. She's just lambed. In her environment, we include the lamb. So as the lamb suckles, there's bacteria on its face and its nose and in its mouth in that get onto the teat or into the teat canal then to cause infection of the mammary gland. Uh, there's other environmental bacteria too, such as uh, feces from both the ewe and her lambs, as well as other environmental contaminants. So we might get bird uh, droppings and feathers, as well as rodent droppings then, that also infect uh, and contaminate the environment and all harbor bacteria. So these other environmental bacteria, they could enter the mammary gland through that teat canal as that you lies down, because it takes a while for that mammary gland to kind of close off after she allows her lambs to suckle. And so there are some anatomical features that help prevent this bacteria from infecting the mammary gland, working our way from the outside to the inside of the mammary gland. At the end of the teat canal, we have what's the teat sphincter. So this is a muscle that can close then to prevent a bacteria from entering into the teat canal initially. However, it takes a while, about an hour or more for it to fully close then after the ewe allows their lambs to nurse. Then we have the teat canal. And this teat canal is lined with keratin, which is produced by specialized cells we call keratinocytes. And this keratin is a waxy substance that impedes bacterial travel then through the teat canal before it actually uh, enters with, to the udder. Keratin also has some antibacterial properties associated with it to help kill a bacteria or at least reduce their numbers that actually are able to enter the gland cistern. And right before the gland cistern, right at the end of the teat canal, we have what's called the Furstenberg's rosette. And this is folds of teat canal tissue that can close off to help uh, seal off any bacteria that have made it into the teat canal from entering into the gland cistern. Again, this Furstenberg's rosette takes a while for it to fully close after milking or after that you allow your lambs to suckle. And it actually weakens over time too, both within a lactation and from lactation to lactation as that you ages. So there are a few different anatomical features that help prevent bacteria from gaining entry into the teat and infecting the gland cistern and udder. And then our lab group is thinking that there might also be some bacteria already circulating within the U that might be able to enter into the mammary gland. So in non-ruminant species, this has been shown that some gastrointestinal bacteria can migrate via the bloodstream to the udder to cause mastitis. And so our group is interested to see if uh, similar bacteria within the rumen and ruminants gastrointestinal tract might be able to enter the udder to cause mastitis. Regardless of how the bacteria get into the mammary gland, uh, once the bacteria are there, they are detected by the immune system, which triggers an inflammatory response. And I'm gonna be talking about the immune response in a few more slides. But first, who are these bacteria? So there are several bacteria associated with mastitis. We have Staphylococcus, both Staphylococcus aureus and coagulase negative Staphylococci, which are basically all Staphylococci other than Staph aureus. And then we also have Streptococcus. And together, these Staphylococcus and Streptococcus bacteria, they're kind of the predominating uh, bacteria that cause uh, mastitis. We especially observe a high prevalence in dairy systems with these. So these are kind of considered to be the major uh, pathogens associated with mastitis. But we still have other pathogens associated with mastitis, including Bacillus, Truparella, Escherichia, Mannheimia, and Pasteurella. So all of these bacteria have varying degrees of pathogenicity, so they all elicit a different uh, level of immune response. However, even though these bacteria are associated with mastitis, they're also harbored in other body sites and even within the environment. So Staphylococci are common members of the skin and mucous membranes. Streptococcus bacteria are also members of the respiratory and urogenital tracts. 
Bacilli are also found in the environment and soil. And true perillobacteria are also found on the skin and in the mucous membranes of the upper respiratory tract. Escherichia, such as E. coli, are found in the gastrointestinal tract. Manheimia are also found in the respiratory tract, and they're also a pathogen that causes pneumonia. And then pastorella are also found in the oropharynx or part of the upper respiratory tract. So this in itself is important to recognize because there are many other sites that harbor these bacteria that cause mastitis. So we can't just simply disinfect the environment and expect these bacteria to disappear because they're already within the U itself. So they're, she's always gonna be shedding bacteria that contaminates the environment as well that can eventually re-enter into uh, the mammary gland to cause mastitis. So I said earlier that I'm gonna briefly touch on the immune response. Immune function and response to bacterial infection is a complex process. And there's gigantic textbooks out there related to immunology. So we're just gonna cover uh, the basis of this immune response within the udder. So the initial response comes as inflammation with goals to allow the body to defend itself from invading pathogens, induce local blood clotting, creating a physical barrier from preventing the infection from splitting into the bloodstream to other body systems. And inflammation also helps promote the repair of injured tissue. And this inflammatory response occurs when tissues are physically damaged or when pathogens are recognized by the immune system. This inflammatory response includes edema or a buildup of fluid along with swelling, heat, redness, and pain. And pain is actually an important part of this immune response and inflammation because it makes the body aware of a problem and immobilize that part of the body to prevent infection spread. So if a you or doe has mastitis and has a lot of pain in the udder, she's probably not gonna allow her lambs or kids to suckle. And obviously that has some consequences uh, because these lambs and kids aren't able to consume milk because she's just kicking them away. So I said earlier that clinical mastitis has these visually apparent signs, so it's easy to detect, especially within your farm or flock or herd, and you just need to manage your animals then and make sure you're walking through them to actually see if there are some issues. And detecting subclinical mastitis is a little bit more challenging, because it's an invisible disease. So there are a few different tools in our toolbox we can use to detect subclinical mastitis. We can have bacterial culture using elevated somatic cell counts or SCC and the California mastitis test or CMT. Over the next few slides, I'm gonna be talking about these more in depth. So bacterial culture is the gold standard diagnostic method. It involves uh, culturing the milk samples so we can plate the milk sample uh, onto these petri dishes on different uh, medias. That's why they're different colors because they uh, differentially select for different types of bacterial organisms. So bacterial culture is the National Mastitis Council standard and there are set protocols then to diagnose subclinical mastitis using a variety of uh, different growth or culture medias. And then once we actually culture these uh, milk samples, we can observe colony growth which would indicate subclinical mastitis. And then we can take those colonies and actually detect and identify the bacterial species that cause mastitis. Again, because some of those bacterial species are more pathogenic, they might be more contagious, and others are less pathogenic. And there are some cons associated with using bacterial culture. The initial con would be the cost. It's about five to seven dollars per milk sample. There are commercial laboratories throughout the country that will culture milk samples. And it takes about 24 to 48 hours within the lab to actually incubate and culture these milk samples. So it can be a few days uh, to get your uh, bacterial culture results back. So it's a little bit time consuming. The next tool in our toolbox we have to detect subclinical mastitis is using somatic cell count. Somatic cells found in milk are white blood cells or leukocytes produced by the immune system in response to inflammatory stimuli that are important for a host defense to recognize, ingest, and destroy these pathogenic bacteria. These somatic cells are primarily these leukocytes, specifically neutrophils, macrophages, and lymphocytes. They can be counted fairly easily and elevated counts can indicate infection. So for those of us familiar with the dairy industry, dairy cows 
uh, have a somatic cell count threshold to infer subclinical mastitis of about 250,000 cells per milliliter. So greater than 250,000 cells per milliliter can indicate that that cow has subclinical mastitis. So this makes some sense because these white blood cells, these immune cells that really increase their numbers because there's some sort of bacterial infection. So they're going to the mammary gland to help fight infection. And that's why we see an increase in these somatic cells, these increase in these white blood cells or leukocytes. In dairy use and does, there's not quite as clear of a recommended threshold to infer subclinical mastitis, even between these two different species. So in dairy use, some would say that the somatic cell count threshold to infer subclinical mastitis is more aligned with the dairy cows. And in dairy does, it's closer to 600,000 cells per milliliter. Other researchers, they think that this number, even 600,000 is pretty low. So they would suggest thresholds closer to 1 million or 1.5 million cells per milliliter to infer subclinical mastitis. And regardless of species, the bulk tank somatic cell count legal limit in the United States is the same, so that's 750,000 cells per milliliter. Some processing plants, they might in have incentives to help reduce that somatic cell count, so there's some premiums associated with lower bulk tank somatic cell counts. But the legal limit is the same across these different species. And in our non-dairy use and does, the threshold to infer subclinical mastitis is highly variable. Some people say that 200,000 cells per milliliter is good to infer subclinical mastitis. Others say that the number needs to be much greater, closer to that 2 million cells per milliliter. Uh, so there are some pros with using somatic cell count. The first one is that it's much cheaper than using bacterial culture. It's about a quarter to a dollar per sample. This cost is dependent on both the laboratory that you're sending milk samples to and the size of the batch that you're sending them into. So if you're only sending a few milk samples, it's gonna be closer to a dollar. But if you're sending in more samples, it's gonna be close to that quarter. An additional pro of using somatic cell count is that most labs include milk component data. So along with somatic cell count, we're gonna get data back to associated with milk fat, milk protein, lactose, and solids. So a lot of valuable data comes from sending samples in for somatic cell count. And then there are some cons with using somatic cell count to infer subclinical mastitis and that it's not a perfect relationship with bacterial culture. So even if there's a low somatic cell count, that doesn't necessarily mean that she's not gonna have bacteria within her milk samples. And somatic cell count is actually highly variable uh, throughout lactation as well. So there's weekly and diurnal or hourly variation. So in this figure here, we have somatic cell count in thousands of cells per milliliter along our y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have weak in lactation going from one to about 22. And this graph represents uh, alpine dairy goats. So early in lactation, we have a really high uh, herd level somatic cell count. It decreases for say the first five weeks into lactation. It's fairly levels off then for the next five or six weeks. And then again, gradually increases and then is quite variable uh, towards the end of lactation. So throughout lactation, there's a highly high variation with this somatic cell count. And then these vertical bars here, they represent uh, the standard error or variation within the herd. So at the same time point, at two weeks in lactation, some does had very low somatic cell counts, about 400,000 cells per milliliter. And other does in that same herd, they had somatic cell counts closer to 1.3 million cells per milliliter. So a lot of variation from individual to individual in somatic cell count. And even uh, within an entire herd, there's quite a bit of variation throughout lactation. And in this other figure, we have somatic cell counts, again, in 1,000 cells per milliliter along our y-axis, and hours 1 to 12 along the x-axis in Manchega dairy use that are 65 to 75 days in milk, which is about 9 to 10 weeks into lactation. So even within a 12-hour period, we have a high of about 230,000 cells per milliliter, and just nine hours later, it decreased to less than 90,000 cells per milliliter. So within a 12 hour period, there's more than two fold uh, changes in somatic cell count. 
And then our final tool we can use to detect subclinical mastitis is the California mastitis test. And the pros of this are that it's an on-farm test, so you get immediate results. This California mastitis test kit comes with the CMT reagent, which is diluted with water. And then it also comes with this uh, well. And there are four wells because it was developed for dairy cattle and they obviously have four teats. So one for each utter quarter. So to do this California mastitis test, we put a stream of milk into each of these wells at an equal amount of this diluted CMT reagent and gently swirl it for 15 or so seconds. And then increasing thickness or gel accumulation indicates increasing somatic cell count. And again, increased somatic cell counts indicates mastitis. So this California mastitis test kit, they have a scoring system with negative trace one, two, or three. So the negative trace values, they are much more fluidy. And then as we get to the twos and threes, that's when we see this increased uh, thickness or gel forming. So again, these twos and threes scores would represent increased somatic cell count, which indicates uh, mastitis. And this entire test kit costs about $16. There's enough CMT reagent to dilute to perform 350 individual tests. So that comes out to a nickel per sample. So a very affordable, quick on-farm test to detect subclinical mastitis. However, of these tools we discussed, this is the least accurate test because we are trying to use this kit to indicate increased somatic cell count and so increased somatic cell count indicates mastitis. So we're trying to indicate an indicator. And there are many costs associated with mastitis, both clinical mastitis and subclinical mastitis. The first few costs are more prevalent in clinical mastitis. So we have veterinary costs when we treat our infected females. Milk replacer, especially uh, clinically infected ewes or does, they might actually dry up. So then we're gonna bum or orphan their lambs or kids and have to purchase milk replacer. And if they develop clinical mastitis, we're often going to have premature culling. We would have liked to have them another few lactations, but because of this clinical mastitis, we're going to cull them. So then we have uh, increased costs associated with replacement use or dose. And even with subclinical mastitis, we observe increased lamb and kid morbidity and mortality. So these subclinically infected animals rearing their lambs and kids, uh, these lambs and kids are more likely to get sick and die. And subclinically infected ewes also have reduced milk yields by about 11 to 58%. Again, that depends on the breed, your management system. And if a ewe or doe has reduced milk yields, we're going to have reductions in pre-weeding lamb growth. Some of these reductions in pre-weeding growth uh, can be compensated by the lamb or kid consuming additional creep feed. So that would be another cost of mastitis. Some of our data out of Montana State had showed that Rambolet use was subclinical mastitis around lambing, specifically about three to five days after they lambed, had litters that weighed six and a half pounds less at summer turnout when the lambs were a month and a half old. And these litters still weighed 11 and a half pounds less at weaning when they were 120 days old. And these numbers are in comparison with lambs or litters reared by use that did not have subclinical mastitis early in lactation. So early lactation mastitis can have lasting impacts on her lambs throughout the entire lactation, even through weaning. So let's talk about the prevalence of mastitis now. I said earlier, we had two states. We have clinical mastitis and subclinical mastitis. So the remainder of our females would be considered healthy. Again, clinical mastitis has these visually apparent signs in the udder, so it looks swollen, firm, and feverish or hot to the touch. And in the milk, so there might be a normal odor, color, or consistency. And across literature, across farms and flocks and herds, this prevalence of clinical mastitis is pretty much the same, about three to 5%. On really good years, this prevalence might decrease to about one to 2%. On really bad years, you might see clinical mastitis in seven, eight, 9% of your females, but pretty consistent overall. Subclinical mastitis is much more variable across the literature and across flocks and across herds, but in general, greater than 15%. And 
And again, these subclinically infected ewes look the same as healthy ewes. So there's no signs in the udder or milk or infected animal itself. And the prevalence of subclinical mastitis in general is greater than 15%. And uh, some of our flocks that we've researched specifically here at the University of Wyoming, we've observed subclinical mastitis frequencies about 90% in our use at some times throughout lactation. So very high subclinical mastitis prevalence, generally greater than 15%, so at least three to five times more than the prevalence of clinical mastitis. And then these red arrows indicate directionality of progression of disease. So a healthy you, she may develop clinical mastitis, or she may develop subclinical mastitis throughout lactation, or she just may stay healthy. If she develops subclinical mastitis, that may progress to develop into clinical mastitis, or as I said earlier, that there is some self-cure. So a subclinically infected you or doe might go back to being healthy within a single lactation. However, if a you or doe gets clinical mastitis, there's virtually no chance of having a cure rate to either go back to a subclinical infection state or to go back to healthy. And there's lasting tissue damage associated with clinical mastitis as well. So overall, clinical mastitis, about three to 5% prevalence. Subclinically infected use look the same as healthy use. There's no visually apparent signs. Much greater prevalence than clinical mastitis, at least 15%. But again, we've seen some prevalence closer to 90%. When can mastitis occur in a lactation? Well, as I said earlier, bacterial mastitis is the most common uh, type of mastitis, and there's always gonna be bacteria around us. So there's always gonna be bacteria in the environment and uh, in the lamb or kids as they uh, suckle on their dam. So there's always risk of bacterial infection of the mammary gland. In this figure, we have the California mastitis score frequency ranging from zero to 40%, just to make this graph a little bit shorter. And on the uh, x-axis, we have day of lactation. We collected milk samples at one, two, and 28 days after lambing, and again at weaning and post-weaning. And these different colored bars represent different California mastitis test scores. So we have the negative and trace in the reds and greens. And then these blue and purples represent the elevated California mastitis test. So this is when we see more thickness or a gel forming in that reaction. And we can easily see that we have these blue and purple bars at every time point in lactation. So there's always subclinical mastitis within our flock. However, there are some greater uh, prevalences of subclinical mastitis. Shortly after lambing, we'd have a prevalence close to uh, 45%. And again, at weaning, this is about 50% of use had subclinical mastitis. And post-weaning, this jumped up even more to about 60%. So we always observe some subclinical mastitis within our flock, but there are some time points where we're already handling ewes that we can use to implement strategic uh, management practices to help reduce that risk of mastitis. So taking a step back, let's do a quick recap here. Clinical mastitis is much easier to detect than subclinical mastitis because we have those visually apparent signs. However, subclinical mastitis is much more prevalent in most production systems, about three to five times more prevalent than clinical mastitis, likely much more. So in this figure here, we have this ewe that we can see she has clinical mastitis, but there's about five times more ewes that have subclinical mastitis within our flock. And again, the remainder of ewes would be considered healthy. And so these subclinically infected ewes, if they had mastitis during early lactation, they have lasting impacts on offspring observed even at weaning. So let's think of a hypothetical scenario. Let's say we have a flock of 100 ewes and 33% of ewes experience subclinical mastitis uh, during the first few days after they lambed. And each of these ewes had litters that weighed 11 and a half pounds lighter than litters that were reared by healthy ewes. So if we take these numbers, 33 ewes times 11 and a half pounds uh, lighter litters at weaning, that's 380 pounds of lost weight at weaning. So that's a substantial loss of weaning weight that we could have had if all of our ewes had been healthy. 
Again, this number is likely dependent on the prevalence of subclinical mastitis. So it might be more if more use had subclinical mastitis, or it might be less if it's closer to that 15%. And lambs can uh, consume creep feed to help compensate for reduced uh, milk yields associated with subclinical mastitis. So this 11 and a half pounds might be a little bit less. Again, it depends on your flock or herd and uh, management uh, through the pre weeding growth period. So if we consider the market price, if we lost 300 pounds of weight at weaning, that's $1,000 of lost revenue and a small flock of 100 ewes. So hopefully we have lower prevalences of subclinical mastitis, and hopefully these lambs didn't perform as poor as these lambs that we've observed in our research projects. But regardless, we're losing income, we're losing revenue because of subclinical mastitis. So going back to some of these tools we can use to detect subclinical mastitis, again, bacterial culture is our standard diagnostic method, but it's much more costly than these others, so about five to seven dollars per sample. We can use increased somatic cell counts to infer subclinical mastitis a little bit cheaper, about a quarter to a dollar per sample. And then the California mastitis test, this provides a quick on-farm immediate results and it's about a nickel per sample. So maybe in our flock or herd, as we really handle these animals as a ewe or doe, lambs or kids, we bring them into the jug, maybe we do a quick CMT test. And if they're at this two or three, maybe then we consider sending in a milk sample for bacterial culture to see what type of bacteria we're dealing with, or even an increased somatic cell count if we don't wanna spend that extra money on bacterial culture. So here comes the big question, can we control mastitis? Well, as I said throughout this presentation, there's always gonna be bacteria within the environment. So there's always risk of having that infection within the mammary gland. So we're never gonna be able to completely eliminate either clinical or subclinical mastitis from our flock or herd. But we can implement some best practices to help uh, manage mastitis within our flock or herd. So some of these best practices would be at lamb you're kidding, make sure the jugs are clean, sanitized, and dry before bringing the next set of newborns. So the cleaner and drier the jug is, the less it provides a more unfavorable environment for bacteria to really grow and reproduce within the environment. So if it's clean and dry, you're not gonna get a lot of bacterial reproduction within the environment. So that would minimize the risk of mastitis. And Aside from the jugs, we also just always wanna keep our environments as clean and dry as possible, especially in our indoor housed uh, pairs. And some of our research that we've conducted here as part of my dissertation program, we've looked at the cleanliness of jugs to see if that influences subclinical mastitis. We're still working through the data. So maybe in a few months, we'll actually have some results then that shows uh, that cleaning out the jugs, sanitizing, and allowing them to dry before bringing the next set of newborns really helps reduce that subclinical mastitis prevalence. Uh, there's also been some vaccines developed then that target some mastitis pathogens. So this Vimco vaccine has been approved by the USDA for use in dairy and meat goats. And this specifically targets our Staphylococcus bacteria. It's about $2 per dose. And then this lysogen vaccine requires extra label use in our sheep and goats. And again, just targets a few specific uh, mastitis pathogens. So even if our veterinarian recommends we use one of these vaccines within our flock or herd, we're only targeting a few different bacteria uh, species. So there's a lot of bacteria associated with mastitis, if you recall from one of my earlier slides. So even if we vaccinate the entire flock or herd, there still could be mastitis within our flock or herd uh, resulting from these other bacterial species. And I think as we've learned for, throughout this global pandemic that vaccines don't provide complete protection from developing a disease, but it does reduce some of those clinical signs or symptoms associated with disease. And then there's also some things we can do as producers at dry up or when we wean our lambs and kids. Uh, the sheep production handbook recommends restricting feed and water access to reduce the plane of nutrition specifically reducing protein levels around weaning. 
And antibiotics are commonly used within our dairy cattle industry uh, that can be used either intramammary, which require extra label use in our small ruminants, or systemic uh, antibiotics, so such as injecting uh, intramuscular injection of penicillin. And uh, these weaning treatments were what we use in my dissertation project. Again, we're looking at some of the data yet, but we had some use that had reduced plan of nutrition uh, two days prior to weaning and three days after well, weaning, excuse me. And then we also gave some use some antibiotics and some use uh, had this combination treatment. Again, we're still working through the data, but again, in a few months, hopefully we'll have some publications out that show that these all provide some level of cure, probably not gonna completely eliminate all mastitis with any of these, but at least reduce uh, the prevalence. And we can also, uh, also monitor individual animal health, specifically udder health as it regards to mastitis. So we can palpate udders and ensure the teats are healthy. As we bring these user does into the jugs, strip them, make sure that we don't have clinical mastitis already in the colostrum, make sure that there's no uh, masses or uh, lumps in the udder. And anytime that we handle a ewe or doe, we can always quickly palpate the udder, check the teats, make sure they don't have any scabs or scar tissue, especially after those lambs and kids begin to have their teeth erupt. And if a ewe or doe with, does develop clinical mastitis, we wanna make sure we're culling those, even if it's a pet animal, because that mammary tissue never fully recovers. So if this tissue is not recovered, she's never gonna be at the same level of milk production as she was prior to mastitis. And are there any genetic selection of practices that we can implement to help control mastitis? There's been some research to help estimate some genetic parameters within our dairy use and does and non-dairy use and does. Uh, so heritability is an estimate of the degree of resemblance for the offspring's performance compared to the, the uh, performance of its parents. So the heritability of somatic cell count or somatic cell score is estimated, estimated to be about 0.12 to 0.24 in our dairy animals. Similar ranges about 0.07 to 0.11 in our non-dairy small ruminants. So this just means that there's a lot of environmental factors that affect somatic cell count. So even if a U has a low somatic cell count, that doesn't necessarily I mean that all of her female offspring will have low somatic cell counts as well. And repeatability is another genetic parameter that basically uh, is a measure of how much the this current lactations or past lactations somatic cell count is predictive of future lactation somatic cell count. It's a little bit higher of an estimate compared to our heritability, so about 0.24 to 0.31. And this makes sense because we're talking about the same individual female. So essentially, if a ewe has a low somatic cell count in this lactation, that doesn't necessarily mean in future lactations, she's still gonna have low somatic cell counts. It's highly variable. There's a lot of environmental factors that go into mastitis and somatic cell counts. So is there hope in the future? Well, there's quite a bit of research going on that focuses on animal health and well-being. Uh, our research group has looked at uh, mastitis and animal health and well-being as it relates to uh, ovine mastitis. And our friends in the dairy cattle industry are beginning to use more mastitis and mammary health traits to improve their herd genetics. Some breeders are utilizing these mastitis-resistant pro sires. And the highlights of this program include avoiding costly mastitis cases and saving money reducing waste milk and keeping valuable replacement heifers, lower antimicrobial use, and providing a genetic selection to mastitis resistance. Uh, as I mentioned previously, there's also some progress in developing vaccines with approved use for our small ruminants. But going back to the genetics, as of now, our non-dairy flock NSIP or National Sheep Improvement Programs don't utilize estimated breeding values related to mammary health or mastitis. And this probably isn't in the near future because the commercial flock data and the need is lacking. So in our, especially in our extensively managed uh, flocks, we're not gonna be collecting enough milk samples to really build up that database to use to build our EBVs. 
So taking a step back, again, how can we manage mastitis? It's important to first identify the prevalence of mastitis within your flock or herd. Clinical mastitis is easy uh, to detect. We have visually apparent signs in the udder and milk an infected animal herself. So as long as you're maintaining good records within your flock and herd, uh, we want to call those using those with clinical mastitis because that mammary tissue never fully recovers. So she's never gonna be able to produce that same amount of milk again in future lactations. We also want to keep our facilities clean and dry. Again, clean and dry facilities prevent some of that environmental growth of bacteria. So if there's fewer bacteria within the environment, that lowers your risk of mastitis. We also want to follow our best practices at weaning and dry off. So reducing that plane of nutrition, restricting our feed and water access, lowering the uh, protein levels within the ration will help that you or dough dry off, reducing milk production, repartitioning nutrients away from milk production to that maintenance. We also want to consult with our veterinarians on using these mastitis vaccines or antibacterial drugs. We don't know if these vaccines will, uh, are even necessary within your flock. If you have a really low prevalence of mastitis, we don't just wanna waste a vaccine if there's no need for it. And again, with antibacterial drugs, we wanna make sure we're only treating user does that have mastitis to help prevent that increase in antibacterial resistance that we sometimes observe. And again, we wanna call those uh, use and dose with clinical mastitis or poor utter health. And we can also call our poor performing use and dose. Though there are many reasons lambs and kids don't grow well, uh, subclinical mastitis does reduce milk yield and that could be a driver of reduced lamb growth. So for calling our poor, poorest performing use and dose, the ones that have offspring that aren't as heavy at weaning, that might be attributed to subclinical mastitis. So calling those animals out of our flock or herd might help manage mastitis within our flock or herd. And with that, that concludes this presentation. Thank you for joining us on the Zoom session, uh, as well as those of us watching on the, this YouTube video. And with that, we're gonna open the panel to, uh, for questions. Oh, thank you so much, Ryan. That was a fantastic presentation. Thanks. Um, I think that if somebody didn't learn something from it, I don't know what to tell them. Um, <laughs> you covered everything. So you have a lot of questions in here and um, we'll go ahead and let Chad and Carmen jump on if they are available and we can just have a little chat about some of the things. Um, I guess one of the things that popped up a lot early on was you know, are there places that you can recommend as far as purchasing some of those test kits, like the California mastitis kit and that type of thing? So this California mastitis test kit, it's uh, available for purchase. Uh, we can find it at any of our uh, veterinary uh, websites then. And uh, again, we're kind of indicating an indicator of subclinical mastitis. So the accuracy is much less than actually culturing the bacteria. And so there is more likely to be more false negatives or false positive results than uh, culturing or even using somatic cell counts because we're getting closer to that exact source of uh, mastitis. Yeah, that it's, it's tough when you can't be sure you know, how many false answers that you might get. So and do you see this as being a tool that, you know, if we're having a flock that we're not seeing a lot of issues clinically and we're not having dairy animals, I mean, what is your recommendation as far as getting these animals tested? And because, I mean, it can get kind of spendy if you just willy nilly go out and test everybody. And I mean, what do you think about that? Because oh, I know absolutely. we have an economic Im implication, right? But where did, where's the break, break even? Right, that? absolutely. So we're definitely not going to be out in our flocks or herds collecting milk samples from every animal every day. That would just be ridiculous. But if we can do a random selection at convenient time points. So again, as those user does are moved into the jugs, we can do a quick California mastitis test there. Or anytime we're working them through a shoot, do a quick California mastitis test. 
Again, it's about a nickel per test. So fairly affordable then, way cheaper than a cup of coffee. And just keep on doing those random selection. And maybe if we see a lot of those uh, increased CMT scores, a lot of that jelly or thickness forming, maybe then we consider sending in a few of those samples into a lab then for bacterial culture. Again, a little bit more expensive, five to $7 per sample, but you get a lot of uh, valuable information that you can use in consultation with your veterinarian to help uh, get mastitis under control within your flock or herd. Yeah. And I wonder too, if, you know, are there some signs that maybe the lambs are giving off? Um, you know, could it be if we see some of these lambs that are hungry or um, maybe they're not performing as well? Could this be something that they are, you know, experiencing that maybe they don't like the taste of the milk or she's not making enough or it's not good quality? I mean, is that something that we can pick out by watching the behavior of the offspring as well? Maybe. I know there's research going on at the University of Wisconsin at Madison by one of their scientists there, and she's specifically looking at behavior of both the lamb and the ewe with regards to clinical and subclinical mastitis. Hopefully she gets some data published soon, but if we do notice some of these poor performing lambs and kids, maybe we grab their dam and quickly do a CMT test to see if we do have a uh, the, that increased gel or thickness forming, maybe then we send in that sample then to see if we can be like, yes, this ewe has subclinical mastitis. She has reduced milk yields. That's why her lambs aren't performing as well. Now that kind of brings me to a topic that's mildly unrelated, but um, you know, a lot of times in my experience, when I've had lambs that are not getting what they need as far as milk production goes, oftentimes you can go out and milk milk a ewe out and she seems like she's producing pretty well based on what you can milk out in one sitting. Um, and so it's, it's really difficult to know, is she really not making the milk that that lamb needs or is something going wrong with the way that that lamb is accessing her or, you know, it could come back to taste or flavor. And I wonder too, you know, when we have clinical mastitis that, um, sometimes you can, you can smell and taste something off, but are you going to be able to do that with a subclinical case where the lamb might be able to? Yeah, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. I've, I don't yeah. drink raw milk, and especially from like a range type flock. So I don't know if the flavor really changes that much. Yeah. I don't think there's many uh, changes in milk components in particular, but I don't know about those flavor attributes then. And like you said, there are a lot of different factors that might uh, influence why this lamb isn't growing well. It might just not be a subclinical mastitis. It might be a wide variety of different factors then. Yeah, it's always hard to speculate on these things, right? Uh, we did have a question about uh, precocious udder when what causes that, do you know? Uh, I'm not very familiar with that, unless if one of you other panelists are. Any thoughts on that, Chad? I'm still muted, huh? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I guess I would kind of, if someone could maybe type in the, in the chat of what they mean by precocious utter. I think that would help to clarify it a little bit to us. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll have to apologize up front. My uh, mastitis experience is strictly limited to when I've experienced it in my own flock. So um, I'll be asking a lot of questions of you guys and hopefully you can answer them. So, um, so we have a question here about reducing feed intake. So if we reduce feed intake just two days prior to weaning, um, you know, what kind of examples can you, can you give us? Or is that cutting back on the supplemental grain? Are we decreasing protein? What's going to be the most effective way to um, reduce mastitis occurrence at weaning time from a feeding standpoint? Right. So on top of just prior to weaning, we want to make sure that we're extending that uh, post weaning too, then to make sure that the ewe doesn't keep on producing a lot of milk. And again, really reducing that protein levels really helps that you or dough dry up too. And then we want to keep them on that lower plane of nutrition, not completely restricting feed and water access for 
very long since that obviously would have very negative consequences, but keeping them on that reduced plant of nutrition, even for about two weeks, I believe is what the sheep production handbook recommends on that lower plane of nutrition that reduced protein in particular. Great. Yeah, and I, I think that kind of goes to some other questions related to prevention, <clears throat> Ryan. So there was another question about utilizing lime in the jug. And so isn't that something that your study is kind of targeted towards some of those jug management decisions? Yeah, so that was one component of my dissertation was uh, we had a couple different uh, treatment groups then. So in one treatment group, we allowed the soiled budding to keep on building up and up. So before we br brought in the next set of uh, lambs, we would just add fresh straw in. So we're just going to have a lot more bacteria within uh, the soiled budding below that. And then the other treatment group was fully removing all the previously soiled manure and bedding out of the jug, uh, putting barn lime on the jug to help really dry it out. It can kind of serve as some sort of disinfectant that provides really unfavorable conditions to uh, these bacteria to really grow and survive within the environment. So putting barn lime is recommended, then it really helps dry off the jug and prevent bacterial growth. Yeah, so with that being said, do you have any information on the differences in the rates of mastitis that we see in using confinement versus pasture use? or even just use that are shed lambed versus open field lambing. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't have uh, any data specifically related to like shed housing systems versus like pasture housing systems. All of my experience has been in shed lambing systems uh, up through uh, early lactation at least then up at Montana, we do turn out the use and lambs on a summer pasture here at the University of Wyoming they really stay within confinement and through weaning. But on pasture with that lower stocking density, we'd expect a lower prevalence of mastitis because uh, there's less of that bacterial contamination. But again, I don't have any specific data to talk about differences in prevalence in particular. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of um, operation to operation, but certainly in my mind, you know, the closer we keep them all together, the, the more likely it is that they can transmit different things and, and have more opportunity with some of those bacteria that are involved. And I also think it's important to note that, you know, there are times when we as people can be doing everything that we possibly can um, to, you know, assist our animals. Um, but it's little things like, you know, not washing your hands between um, messing with different udders or animals and um, or even a shared bottle that you might be giving different lambs the same nipple. Um, and, and just keeping in mind that bacteria can be transferred in that way, too, or through walking through, um, you know, your your newborn lamb flock with dirty boots on from another part of the farm. So. These are all really um, important things to think about from a biosecurity standpoint that you can try to reduce risk of, of transmission of these bacteria as well, just through um, clean management from your own standpoint. So um, these guys mostly have all heard the soapbox I get on about biosecurity, <laughs> but it's, it's super important even from this this perspective and not even just the zoonotic transmission between humans and sheep. So, um, yeah. So, um, sorry, Chad, I wasn't prepared with my next question. Well, I'll let, <clears throat> it sounds like we got some people in the chat that are, um, giving us answers for precocious udder. Um, oh, good. a couple, couple different definitions seem like they're popping up, um, as far as, development in that mammary tissue or even building up milk in some cases prior to being bred or or beyond where they should be in their stage of gestation. So I'm not exactly sure what definition we want to go with, but I'm, I'm fairly unfamiliar with this and I don't know if I could give a great answer on that. Um, 
but similar, I would imagine if I was to, to take a guess um, that, you know, those, the same reason we bring down that plane of nutrition is to reduce that buildup of milk, right? And so I'd imagine that as that milk sits up there longer, they, they could be more predisposed. However, I, I don't truly know. And I'd probably have to do some research on that before I really knew anything. So <clears throat> um, we do have some other questions on, on whether or not people are able to just send in samples from their animals to their, these testing labs on their own. So what, uh, I guess a, a question for Ryan, what, what labs are there for us to send samples to or companies and how do we find these places? Right, absolutely. So there's a lot of milk labs throughout the country. Uh, one of the past webinar speakers, Dr. Justine Britton, uh, she takes milk samples from dairy cows, goat, sheep, any type of animal then, so you can send milk samples to uh, her then. And that webinar, again, is posted on the uh, YouTube page then, so you can look for specifics and what they like. But we, just a quick, simple uh, DHIA approved laboratory search in Google will provide a long list of uh, milk labs that will do this. They have submission forms uh, on those websites then, and they, again, want to recommend some sampling procedures. So usually there's like a two ounce vial that will strip milk into and then uh, refrigerate it and then uh, ship it on ice or with ice packs then to that commercial laboratory uh, for testing either bacterial culture or somatic cell count testing. But there's a lot of different uh, laboratories across the country that will do this. So just go to Google, Google DHI, DHIA milk labs, and that'll get you a good a start to find some of these resources. But you can definitely do it yourself. You don't need any county agents or extension specialists or anything to collect these milk samples. You obviously wanna limit uh, any possible contamination you might put in that milk sample. So make sure you wash your hands at least if you can't wear any uh, latex gloves to collect those milk samples. But we may wanna make sure we're not contaminating those milk samples before we send them especially if we're culturing those milk samples. Okay. Thank you very much, Ryan. Yeah, we, uh, we have some conversation about, you know, stripping um, teats at the, at the birth of a lamb. And, and is that your recommendation then as far as decreasing disease transfer from animal to animal through human contact? is you know a good wash um, of your hands between latex gloves changed in between animals but are there any other methods that we can do to sort of if we're in there anyway should we be cleaning the udder with something doing some some sort of um you know hygiene related practices <laughs> i would say just using washed hands uh germex if you want preferably gloved hands would be good enough then. And we want to make sure we are stripping those teats out to get rid of that keratin plug. So we really ensure that our lambs and kids get that colostrum. Then if there's too much of a plug buildup, it's going to be hard for them to remove it. So really at that time point, we're going to be focusing and to make sure that the lamb or kid gets the colostrum they need to really build up their immune system. And then from a mastitis standpoint, uh, if you're able to best practices, wash your hands at the very least between uh, collecting samples or stripping out teats then, especially when we're dealing with like some of the uh, birthing fluids too. We want to make sure our hands are stay really clean. I wouldn't necessarily say we want to disinfect the udder and teat because that pen is going to get dirty then. So it's going to, any purpose of that's going to be short-lived. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's, mostly crucial for us to just be really cautious um, crossing between animals. So, um, Chad, you were, or you were about to ask one, I think. Yeah, so Ryan, you did a really good job talking about some of the variation that occurs with somatic cell count and <clears throat> throughout both uh, throughout the day and then also throughout lactation. What, what kind of somatic cell differences occur between maybe the colostrum versus 
versus actually getting into regular milk. Um, and I mean, me and you both have had quite a few experiences milk and sheep together sometimes, um, but um, you want to kind of discuss maybe that change of colostrum to milk and maybe where that somatic cell count lies in there. Sure. So I have not collected colostrum milk samples then especially like shortly after birth to send those in for a somatic cell count. And I'm not really well versed in actually reading up on that literature. But since that colostrum is produced really uh, before that you really begins lactation. So that udder is still closed off, that teat is sealed off then. So there's not gonna be any bacteria from the environment within that mammary gland. So there's really no need for an immune response at that time point. So it's likely much, much lower than in milk samples once that teat canal opens then and there's lambs or kids suckling all the time and access to these environmental bacteria. So likely gonna be less, but again, I'm not 100% sure on that since I haven't collected that data myself. Yeah. And, and you're right on, Ryan, at least with some of the stuff that you were helping me do during my PhD, um, and that those somatic cell counts were relatively low, even within the first 24 hours. But it's important to point out that the change of the composition of, um, of colostrum changes really rapidly from, you know, that first hour of parturition or lambing to 24 hours afterwards, um, there's a drastic change in the composition of, of that colostrum before it starts becoming more of a, what we would consider a normal milk, right? Um, but where we started seeing those somatic cell numbers really increase is around day six to day nine, and then they drop down for a point and then go back up around weaning time, how you had mentioned with some of the research that you were citing with us. So I think that, like you said early on, there really isn't a lot of exposure to those bacteria. Um, so not a lot of infection happening um, until, you know, half a week to a week after lambing. So I hope that helps answer some of those questions for people. And also like the initial immune cells to respond to that site of bacterial infection, it does take a few hours. And so even if there's already bacteria in there, you might not observe that increase in somatic cell counts for a few hours. And other immune cells are much slower in the response. So they don't arrive for uh, one to three days after that initial immune cell response. So it can be a little bit after that you or doe gets a bacterial infection in the mammary gland before we even see that increased somatic cell count. Great. That's a, that's a great point, Ryan. Yeah, so there's there's a handful of questions um, regarding treatment, and I will just remind everyone if we go into this topic that we are not veterinarians, and you should be working with a veterinarian. Um, you know, on any of these cases, make sure you have a good patient client, or I mean, a <laughs> vet client uh, relationship with your vet, so that when you have something that pops up like this, and you give them a call, they feel comfortable filling prescriptions for you and that type of thing. Um, but, you know, let's, let's do chat for a minute about kind of the high level things that we might want to do when we're treating mastitis cases in our sheep and goats. And I have some ideas because of, you know, experiences that I've had with some on my own farm and work with, I, that I've done with my own veterinarian, but maybe you have some thoughts first before I, um, <laughs> say anything about that. Uh, well, as I said throughout this presentation, subclinical mastitis is what is much more prevalent. And sometimes we can just wait for that self-cure, then let the immune system actually do its job then and get rid of those bacteria. So before we start uh, using a lot of these uh, antibacterial drugs, if it's clinical mastitis, that's a different case because we don't have that cure rate. We want to make sure that that you stays in as best of health and make sure she's comfortable then with clinical mastitis. Uh, but for subclinical mastitis, sometimes it might just be best to wait for that self-cure, let the immune system do its job. So with that, Ryan, do you think that, you know, I've had some producers call and talk to me. Um, if we have a rate of just, you know, two to 3% clinical mastitis on our operation, should, should that be acceptable? To 
it's definitely average then whether or not it's acceptable is up to varying opinions then so obviously we want zero percent but that's really unlikely then so just a couple percent prevalence of clinical mastitis that's pretty good again we want to call those use in those with clinical mastitis because that mammary gland is really damaged that tissue never fully recovers so extra two percent into your culling factors probably not the worst thing in the world yeah and i block. And I, and I would probably just suggest that in times like right now, where price on coal use is really good, this may be a good time to go through your flock, bag everything, anything with old incidences of mastitis um, to just start anew. Um, I have one producer nearby and uh, pretty funny, but he, he's been mentioning to me recently that any you that looks at him sideways is going to the to the sale and he's okay uh, starting over with some new animals because we're getting paid a fairly good price for cola animals currently. So in years like this, I would make a strong recommendation that people take advantage of that and any kind of problem animals we can get rid of. So what yeah, were you gonna I say? Think, I mean, it just kind of boils down when you're looking at a clinical case of mastitis um, is she bad enough that you need to intervene? And, and in my mind, it's kind of a, um, pain and inflammation management strategy. Um, and knowing full well that there's no likelihood of keeping her around for, uh, for another year. Um, because quite frankly, if she's down half a half of her udder and she has twins, you're still going to raise a lamb. So it's important to just note that she's going down the road once she has that clinical sign. Um, but yeah, having some, some pain relief and some inflammation management and probably some antibiotic intervention, um, especially if you're going to attempt in any way to try to have her help you raise a lamb. Um, but I do feel like once it gets bad enough, a lot of times you're going to end up raising that lamb anyway, or you know, have somebody else raise that lamb or whatever it is that's your protocol. Um, but it's, it's, um, in my mind, it's just keeping her comfortable until you can get her down the road. And I don't know, maybe you have some other thoughts on that severe clinical treatment. Nope. I completely agree with you. <laughs> so. I think, I think a lot of times too, in the livestock industry, the best treatment is preventative treatment. Mm -hmm. Right. And just making sure, like Ryan emphasized over and over, keeping things clean and uh, stuff like that gives us the best chance for success. Well, and that being said, what is your um, thoughts on, you know, if you're if you're bagging your ewes or your does um, prior to lambing, prior to any milk production? I mean, what's your rule of thumb? What are you what are you looking for when you're saying, OK, this you needs to be cold or she's got, you know, a case of overlooked clinical or subclinical that's caused her some issues in her utter, what are we actually looking for at the, at the smallest level? What are we going to get rid of? You know, is it a pea-sized hard bag or a, you know, what are we looking for there? All right. So I think that again, depends on, on the specific type of production system and what a producer wants to do. Uh, if you just want to really do the severe cases, the really large uh, lumps or intermammary masses, or if there's just a lot of smaller ones, definitely do that. But it's just identifying the level that you're comfortable with dealing with within your own flock or herd. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I've found to be the most interesting is that, you know, sometimes you can feel a small mass or hardness in her udder prior to breeding or prior to lambing. Um, and you think, oh, this is just, it's minor. It's not a big deal. And then it becomes a big deal um, at the time that she lambs. And so it's, it's important to know that when she's not making any milk, what's happening there is going to be um, dramatically increased in the, in the severity once there is milk being made. So um, I have in the past made the mistake of thinking, oh, it's not that bad. I'll keep her around. Well, that was a bad choice. So I, I just like to note it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so and I, I, I can learn I, from my mistakes, right? <laughs> yeah, 
Well, and sometimes those ewes that get mastitis and we end up missing because maybe it's later in lactation and we turn them out to pasture and we go a while not really checking on their bags or or maybe they had something set up after weaning that we didn't see. Uh, Later on, you know, you can go back and find some of those golf ball sized, you know, lumps or maybe an involuted udder where one udder kind of comes down and the other doesn't. And you know, those are generally pretty good signs of the type of use that you want to get rid of, even though maybe during last lambing, we didn't see them in that state. So. Yeah. So sort of shifting gears about vaccinations. Um, we have a question here where uh, they were able to vaccinate and against a high positivity in their flock. And then um, the following year had almost no cases of mastitis. And so what are your thoughts on continued vaccination once you have sort of your flock under control? Is there benefit to continuing or benefit to waiting and seeing how we might have a return instance of mastitis cases or what are your thoughts there? Uh, I think, Again, we don't, I haven't had any experience with any of these uh, mastitis vaccines, but if you do it every year, that just provides that extra booster of immunity then. So definitely not a bad thing. It just really helps prepare that immune system then for uh, when they have to deal with that specific bacteria. Right. Do you have any thoughts on genetic testing that might allow us to understand if our user are predisposed or not for, you know, extra early polling purposes. (laughs) Right, so right now there's not a lot of uh, genetic selection or genetic markers as it relates specifically to mastitis. There's some uh, genetic markers related to immune function. So maybe in the future we can better relate those back to mastitis, but right now, not a whole lot we can do there. Okay. There is a couple of questions about Covex and eight and whether or not there's any benefit towards mastitis of that particular vaccine protocol. Uh, I am not super familiar with Covex and eight. It primarily um, targets the coccidia stats or the coccidia bacteria. So I would suggest that it's probably not a primary mastitis vaccine, but I am also not totally familiar with all the bacteria that cause mastitis. So (laughs) I know you gave us kind of a list at the beginning. I don't know if any of those were a part of it, so. Yeah, I was was trying to do some reading on, you know, the different vaccines that Ryan was mentioning for sheep and then also some that are more for our does for clinical mastitis. And those species are fairly different. Um, As far, maybe Ryan, you can answer this. I'm not a bacteria person at all, but um, how how drastic are some of these bacteria species and the mechanism that we have to fight them? Like if we're targeting one species, is the mode of action to target that species similar to, I mean, our streptococcus versus myo plasma or something. I don't, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so uh, the Staphylococcus and Streptococcus species, they're definitely considered to be more of a major pathogenic species, and so they elicit a much greater immune response compared to some of those other species, like bacilli are really an environmental type bacteria, then, so they're not going to elicit that much of an immune response. Just the immune system is still going to try and get rid of those bacillus but they're not gonna cause as much damage as those staph or strep. So definitely different levels of pathogenicity, different levels of immune response, specific different modes of mechanisms within that immune response gets a little bit complicated. And probably differences in how you would attack that from the outside, right? Right. Yeah. Oh. So to me, it makes perfect sense to do some testing to make sure you know exactly which one you're targeting when you have, I mean, that makes sense from that standpoint. It, does the literature point at like a difference of major bacterial species from like East Coast to West Coast at all in the US? 
Uh, so not sure exactly on like geographic regions, but even from like farm to farm and site to site within a small geographic region, we're gonna have different bacteria present in the environment then. So with those different bacteria, they're gonna, again, cause different uh, levels of immune response to that different bacteria when it comes mm -hmm. to mastitis. So definitely differences there. You and the farm down the road might have different bacteria than what we're dealing with. Yeah, just highly variable, huh? We have a question that I love for you to have to answer because <laughs> this is a little bit part of my history in Wyoming as well, but um, what are your thoughts about um, when we change feed or differences in rumen microbiome and how susceptible these animals might be to the, to the pathogenic bacteria? Right, so I think like really we need to consider animal health at the whole animal level. So we really shouldn't just be thinking about specific systems in general. So it's like, if that rumen microbiome is really healthy, it's not in a state of dysbiosis, it's really balanced. We have the right commensal bacteria there. Uh, I think that really just helps the, that you or doe really stay uh, in a healthy state, then that helps promote other uh, organist systems or other functions such as milk production, then to really stay uh, much more healthy. And then if that animal's healthier, they're gonna have a better immune system response than if there is bacterial infection, either in the mammary gland or elsewhere. Yeah, and I agree with that 100%. Uh, the only thing that I would sort of add to that is if we're drastically changing the diet in an animal, you can expect them to have an immune response just in that case because their um, changes in the way that the rumen microbiome has to respond to different feeds and drastic changes are always going to be uncomfortable and possibly cause some major problems for ruminant animals. And so um, if, if you're changing, you know, um, from grass to a clover grass mix from one pasture to the next, it's probably not as big of a problem. Um, but if you're taking them off of a high grain diet and sticking them out on alfalfa, um, I think it's really important to try to transition those animals in a, in a more slow fashion. So over a two or three week period, you know, introducing that new feed in, and that will help them to maintain that good immune status that we're hoping that they have within their rumens. Um, cause it is any, any stress that we apply to the animal will decrease their immune capabilities. So that to me is, is a, an important piece to, to note related to that question. But if we're doing a good job balancing nutrition and giving them things that are not likely to make them sick and not changing them over really quickly, then in my mind, they should be in a good, uh, like you said, a balance in, in their room. And so. But I like that question, so thank you. <laughs> That's the uh, nerd microbiologist in me coming out. <laughs> um, Ted, you got one up close and personal that you want to share with us? Oh, I feel like there's a couple that are kind of hinting at how to manage the lamb as far as either when you have to orphan a lamb early um, or at weaning time, you know, is it best to just cut that you off? And we did talk about bringing that down that plane in nutrition a little bit, but is there any benefit to doing an additional milking at that point post weaning or what are, what are your thoughts on that, Ryan? Uh, so I would say probably not to milk the ewer dough after weaning because that udder is already going through that involution process. We don't want to reopen up that teeth then to possibly allow new bacteria to enter. So probably not to milk uh, after weaning to help taper off that milk production. Just let the udder involution occur through that natural process then to really dry up that animal. And kind of going with that, um, a, a comment on uh, a thought that large lambs that aggressively uh, bump or ram the udder to stimulate some of that letdown. Is there any, I mean, could it cause enough damage to maybe increase the incidence of mastitis? Is that anything that you've ever heard of, Ryan? Uh, I would highly doubt it. It really needs to be really harsher trauma then to really cause that inflammation then. So that lamb or kid then that's just a really aggressive suckler. 
uh, it's just really trying to help stimulate that milk ejection reflex then. But yeah, again, I, it's just a natural part then in, in, the, in nature then. So that just really helps stimulate the milk ejection reflex and the you or dough then is just built to help withstand that then. Yeah, I, I would imagine that more incidences of maybe when those teeth come in, those milking teeth of, you know, maybe cutting small incisions near the teat would have a greater impact on any type of infection or immune response. Right. And that's why we want to make sure we're checking that utter health and to make sure those teats are free of scabs or scars, then especially after those Lancer kids' teeth erupt. Great. So Ryan, related to the, the lambs and kids, are there any concerns with either clinical or subclinical of there be disease transfer to the offspring? Are we, are we going to need to watch those at all um, to make sure they aren't having some kind of disease related response as well? Um, you know, from ingesting or whatever. Uh, right. So, yeah. so there's going to be bacteria within that milk sample then, especially if she has mastitis then. So those lambs or kids are obviously consuming that same bacteria. So hopefully, uh, their rumen can help uh, get rid of those a little bit then and their immune function can go through there. Those immune cells can help target, especially the more pathogenic species. But again, an interesting thing that our lab research group is doing is thinking that that initial milk and colostrum is helping colonize that lamb's uh, rumen then to really help build that healthy bacterial population within that lamb. Yeah, it goes back to the importance of making sure those lambs are getting colostrum early and able to start developing that immune function really quickly and be able to fight that off. Um, so I, I feel like I'm gonna read this question. I'm not sure that I am following, so hopefully you guys will. Um, how and when would you use today tube of cephaparin sodium? Yeah, you might have to read it. <laughs> uh, do you have any application instructions for that? So I believe this cephapyrin is a type of dry off treatment then that usually gets injected through the teat canal. It's more commonly used in dairy cattle. And I believe uh, Dr. Wilson's past presentation has provided instructions on how to use this. I don't have that experience on how to do it. So I hate to say it, but maybe go back to listen to that past webinar. Again, go to the YouTube channel then for University of Idaho Extension Livestock page and look up that past a presentation. I, I don't hate to say it, Ryan. I'll gladly say, please go back and watch some of the past webinars. There, there's such a wealth of knowledge in the different people that come into this that uh, it's, it's good to go back and listen to these other talks that have been given as a reminder, both for us and, and for the audience, so. Yeah, and I did post the uh, link in the chat box. I'll post it again for anybody that got on later, got bumped off or whatever, um, but it's the University of Idaho Extension Livestock channel on the YouTube. Uh, so, you know, check us out, see what we've offered before. A lot of times we try to bring multiple speakers in on the same topic. So we just get some diverse, um, you know, experiences and, and backgrounds and everybody has their own specialty related to that topic. So I think by watching all the different videos that we've offered related to mastitis could probably give you guys some good opportunities um, to bolster what you're hearing from us today. So, um, there's a question here about having a cheesy gland lump on the udder and whether or not it's related at all to mastitis. Do you have any thoughts on that one? Um, not really sure. It could, but not necessarily. Yeah, good call. <laughs> I'm not sure if it would be either. <laughs> Um, I think there was a really good question, Melinda, okay. that just came in, and this kind of goes back to the biosecurity aspect that you talked about. Um, the, the common practice when we bring in new animals is to quarantine for a given amount of time, and this could be for 
diseases or parasites or whatever reason, right? Um, but when we're buying replacement use, what kind of things should we look for? And is there, I mean, a risk of bringing in some kind of bacteria species that may cause mastitis in our flock? All right, so there's always gonna be a risk of introducing new disease uh, into your herd or flock. Uh, with mastitis, uh, usually we're not bringing in replacements then that are currently lactating. Usually they're dry or gestating. So those specific mastitis bacteria are not gonna be uh, shed into the environment then right away, but there are still gonna be other bacteria then that those new replacements are gonna be shedding then uh, as they breathe or defecate but the risk of mastitis is going to be slim. And, and most of those use that we're bringing in, hopefully we've at least kind of bagged and had a, a basic veterinary overlook before we transport them to our own farm. Right. Um, and make sure we're quarantining them too for the two to four weeks then that we like to, so that way they have an environment to shed any possible pathogenic bacteria then and introduce them to bacteria that are on your uh, farm as well, because we all know every farm's gonna have bacteria then, so we need to make sure we introduce uh, new animals or replacement animals to those bacteria as well. Great. All right, well, we're kind of coming to the end of our allotted time today. And I just wanna start by um, closing with everybody who attended, thank you so much for putting so much thought into your questions and participating like you have. This makes it fun for us because we don't have to drive a conversation among the three of us. And I'll also apologize because we have a number of questions left to be answered. And so anybody who doesn't feel like we answered your question or we didn't answer it fully, please reach out to us. Um, I also put our contact information in the chat. Um, we're all willing and and at least able to find an answer for you if we don't have it. So please reach out to us and we're happy to help in any way that we can. So thank you all for joining us. Ryan, thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. We'll definitely me. have you back and we're looking forward to um, finding out some of the results that you are coming up with for your uh, research. And yeah, I'm so excited too. <laughs> <laughs> and probably to be done, right? Yes, that too. <laughs> Um, so Chad, thanks for joining me today also, and um, we will see you next month, and we're going to be talking about extending the grazing season 